Hey guys, welcome back to Ferrigno Freedom Channel. I'm Dante Ferrigno, and this is my buddy Sam back here. And we're coming to talk to you today about an audiobook or a book in general that I've been reading called Why We Get Sick by Dr. Benjamin Binkman. And this is a very interesting book because it looks at something that I haven't thought much about, and I bet you haven't either, and that's insulin. Most people, unless you're a diabetic, don't think a whole lot about insulin. Type 1 diabetics obviously aren't able to produce insulin, so they have to take insulin injections just to have the insulin they need to clear glucose from their blood. And then type 2 diabetics, as you well know, if you have anybody in your family who is type 2 diabetic, and these days the odds are you do, realize that they have to take sometimes insulin when their blood sugar spikes too high. And it puts them in a dangerous situation being diabetic where that blood sugar could actually be deadly to them. Well, insulin, it turns out, plays a much bigger role than I ever thought. And that's what we're going to talk about today because I think it's affecting more of us than I ever would have thought. Check it out. So this book was released in July of 2020. Now, Dr. Binkman is not a medical doctor, but he does have a PhD in bioenergetics, and his focus is adaptations to metabolic surgeries and obesity. So he had a very interesting perspective to take on insulin. He was actually surprised to find out, just like most of us probably will be, to find out what a huge role insulin plays in our lives. So let's start off by me going through some of my notes here, because this book, as short as it is, it was only a six hour audio book. But I think I took more notes initially than the book actually had for writing, <laughs> for writing because it is just jam packed, full of information to help us understand how our bodies work in a much better way. I found it very interesting that he said that at least half, if not two out of three Americans are suffering with insulin resistance, and the number could be as high as 85%. And the reason why we don't know for sure is there is very little testing to do with insulin directly. A lot of our insulin testing has to do with glucose in the blood. And the problem is, is you could be insulin resistant and not have elevated glucose levels for long periods of time. And when you're looking at something like a carnivore diet, you've heard about people already reversing things like type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes doing a diet like carnivore or lion diet. Well, this goes into a lot of the reasons why. But some other things that I didn't know about diabetes, even after having worked as an administrator in a retirement home where I had to deal with diabetics on a regular basis, I learned so much more about insulin than I ever thought I would know. But for those of you who have started a carnivore way of eating because you were wanting to lose weight, one of the interesting things you should know is that one of the first presentations of insulin resistance is excess body fat. And the more a body gains fat, the more it becomes insulin resistant. Now, why is this important? Obviously, you don't want to get diabetes, but there are so many things that he talks about that are related to insulin and chronic illness that just blew my mind. And it helped me to understand why I've been able to reverse some of the problems that I had, like the leaky gut problem that I had that was causing me so much pain, the anxiety and depression issues I was having, high blood pressure, difficulty getting to sleep at night, testosterone being low. There were several issues that I had that it turns out all go back to insulin. So if you're having any of these problems, if you're having issues like ovarian cyst disorders as a woman or a man with erectile dysfunction, or if you're having low T in general, if you're having autoimmune response problems, whether it's a gut problem like I had or something like rheumatoid arthritis, a number of issues all go back tied to insulin because insulin, as it turns out, is a hormone that affects every cell and every tissue in our body, not just the ability to uptake glucose. Of course, that's a big function that insulin does. It tells our body's cells to start taking up glucose to use as energy or to store as energy for later. One of the things that we talk about all the time on this channel is the fact that 
the food system that we follow has been upside down since at least the 1980s, if not going back to the 1960s when people like Ansel Keys were coming up for solutions to how to get us to reverse this heart problem that we had going on, or at least that we perceived was going on. Mostly this came from the fact that Eisenhower had a heart attack and they decided to use that to focus on heart related issues and diet. And for those of you who've been watching for a while, you realize that what they have been telling us to do as opposed to what we were doing before has actually taken us into a much unhealthier position as a result. And as a result of that, the number of insulin resistance related cases has more than doubled in the past three decades. And that ought to be enough cause for concern for you to be taking a look at this because if it's doubling for us over the past three decades and it's anticipated to get even worse, that means we've got to start thinking about what are we going to do to protect our children from the problems that are going to come from insulin resistance and how it's going to cause chronic issues in the body. This used to be a disease that was only considered related to people who were affluent, who had a lot of money and a lot of food. But now, as many as 10% of children are considered to be insulin resistant. And based on some of the things I've read and what I've seen, I'm willing to bet the number is a whole lot higher, especially when we start looking at things like how it affects their puberty changes. Because we get into that in one of the chapters, and it is truly eye-opening to what's been going on as far as our diet goes. So some of the notes I took from chapter one include that in general, insulin is an anabolic hormone that regulates how our cells use energy, grow, and even whether they die or keep living. Insulin plays a role with all other hormones. It makes bigger things out of smaller things through a process called anabolism, not cannibalism, anabolism. Insulin is what tells our cells to convert glucose into energy in our organs, muscles, fat cells, bones, and nerves. So it affects everything about our physiology that makes us what we are, how we think, and even how well we can hear, how well we can moderate our blood pressure, muscle size, fat storage, sex hormones, the list just goes on and on. Okay, so now we know what insulin is, but what is insulin resistance? Well, insulin resistance is when your tissues and organs stop responding to the effects of insulin, or at least reduce their response to the effect of insulin. It's kind of like uh, when you take too much of a particular drug or medicine, eventually you become resistant to that medicine. It doesn't have the same effect as it had before. Well, consider insulin an important thing that our body creates that makes us grow. It makes our organs in our bodies do the things that they're supposed to do. But when we get too much of it, it causes our body to become resistant to its effects which can cause all kinds of problems. So when our cells become resistant to the effects of insulin, that means our pancreas has to produce more insulin to overcome this, the resistance that our body is doing because it keeps detecting glucose in the blood, so it keeps releasing this insulin. So it actually kind of adds fire to the fire because it's causing more insulin resistance simply by having so much insulin in the blood. Well, what causes that insulin in the blood, obviously, is glucose. So if you're eating a lot of dietary glucose, which the standard American diet has way too much glucose as well as other forms of sugar, because all forms of sugar your body eventually recognizes as glucose in your system, even if it's fructose or whatever, the, in the blood it's going to be glucose. Now there's a historical reason why when you go to get tested for insulin, you typically get a glucose check. And that's because it's very easy to detect glucose levels, and it's actually relatively inexpensive compared to checking for insulin. If your blood glucose is normal, your insulin levels are usually normal. But we're finding out now that that may not always be the case. Somebody could be insulin resistant and have totally normal blood glucose levels, and even not have a lot of fat accumulation because of the different ways different people's bodies store fat. Some people who have a certain body type that doesn't retain a lot of fat on the outside might retain a lot of visceral fat, the fat that goes around our organs. And you don't even notice that until they start to get that distended belly that sometimes comes where it's real hard and firm. That internal fat can cause even more problems than the fat we see on the outside. So that's why somebody could look perfectly healthy, have totally normal blood glucose numbers, but because of insulin resistance, they could be causing severe damage to their organs. By studying insulin directly though, studies have been able to show that we can predict diabetes up to 20 years before it takes effect. 
So knowing your insulin numbers can be real important if you're struggling with weight loss or any of the issues that I've mentioned, or even if you know that you're the type of person that burns fat real easily, you should get your insulin checked because you might be on a path toward diabetes or other chronically related issues that could be a big problem for you. As any diabetic will tell you, insulin levels that are causing your blood glucose to stay above 126 means that you've developed type 2 diabetes. And being able to bring those numbers down to a normal level is where we can get out of diabetes. But it doesn't stop with diabetes. He gets into heart health in chapter two. That was basically chapter one, what I just talked about there in some of the introduction. Chapter two, he talks about heart health and how insulin has a huge effect on that. The interesting thing that the author says is that insulin resistance is often considered part of the problem, but in reality, it actually is the problem. Hypertension or high blood pressure puts strain on the heart. And one of the interesting things that the doctor notes is almost everybody who has hypertension is also insulin resistant. Studies have also shown that being insulin resistant directly causes hypertension. The author talks about how insulin resistance can cause blood vessel walls to thicken and then the body, because of insulin resistance, is not able to produce nitric oxide, which is important for widening those blood vessel walls or widening the blood vessel circumference overall so blood flow doesn't go through as well. And that's what causes the high blood pressure. When you hear about nitric oxide, that's something our body produces normally when insulin levels are normal. And you've also heard about people taking nitroglycerin to help with heart pain or chest pain. Well, that's why they take that nitroglycerin is because it has nitric oxide in it, which opens up those blood vessels so that they can allow blood to flow better. Interestingly, this also has a direct effect on our anxiety levels because insulin resistance also triggers our flight or fight response to be on a lot more than it should be. And that's what causes us to have higher levels of anxiety, aside from the normal pressures of life. I mean, sometimes the normal pressures of life are enough, especially when things are as elevated as they have been over the past three years. But when you've got insulin resistance going on, now you've got that adrenal factor in your system is being switched into the on position a lot more than it should be, which is gonna cause you to have higher anxiety. And higher anxiety is gonna to lead to more cortisol production, it's gonna to lead to more fat, and it becomes a vicious cycle. One of the things he talks about in chapter one that I really enjoyed is he goes into detail on LDL and how it can be beneficial as opposed to how it can be harmful. And the key thing that I've always talked about is that it has to do with LDL cell size and also the density of the high LDL cell and you know, LDL stands for low density lipoproteins, but there are high low density lipoproteins and there are lower low density lipoproteins. And the way he described it is the best way I've heard it described so far that helps me to remember is that when you think of the low density lipoproteins, that those would be like throwing a beach ball into a river and that beach ball is just floating downstream. Now the comparison of a high density lipoprotein would be like say taking a golf ball. It's much more compact. It may even have more overall weight than the large beach ball size lipoprotein, but that density packed into a small space, when you throw that into the river, it's not gonna float downstream easily. It's gonna hit the bottom and it's gonna go along the bottom as the stream takes it along. What he says is, is that as those LDL cells are hitting the arterial walls and the blood vessel walls, that's where those deposits of lipid proteins get put on the walls and cause that arterial plaque that clogs our arteries and clogs our blood vessels so that we do get high blood pressure, so that we do have problems with these things. And that's why LDL numbers directly don't have a whole lot to do with what the problem is. If you can have it checked to see which type of LDL you have, A or B, LDL B being the golf ball size and LDL A being the beach ball size, if your LDL molecules are less dense, larger lipoproteins, then they're not gonna have that problem of hitting the arterial wall so much. And that LDL is actually good for our overall body's function, as long as it's flowing downstream. But when it's not flowing downstream, that's when we start to have a problem created. Well, where insulin resistance comes into play is it switches gears from beach ball size LDL to those golf ball size LDL, which causes the problems that we have to watch out for. 
And the interesting thing Dr. Binkman points out here is that using statins to control your LDL actually creates more of the golf ball size and less of the beach ball size. It reduces the overall number, but by adding more of the dangerous LDL molecules, you're actually increasing the problem. Additionally, statins are directly linked to causing insulin resistance. Now, what causes the LDL to actually switch gears from being a good one to a bad one has to do with oxidation. Well, there's another lipid that plays a role in this, and that is linoleic acid. Linoleic acid is the type of fat that is found in vegetable oils. The problem that you have is, is that linoleic acid is easily oxidized, which means that it's going to cause a problem much more readily. But even more so is it'll bind to the LDL molecule and cause oxidation to spread even more. So that's where you get into the problem with the seed oils actually exacerbating the problem even further. So insulin resistance it has a direct link to causing oxidative stress, which interestingly even more is that oxidative stress causes more insulin resistance. So you get that multiplying effect going on when you're consuming things like seed oils and you're also using statins to fight your LDL. So these are the kind of things I would encourage anybody to talk to their doctor about. Look into this book. Maybe you should read this book and share some of this information with your doctor and ask him what he says. Because if you're on a statin, I would definitely be taking a closer look at what that statin is doing to your body. Chapter three goes into how insulin resistance affects our brain. This one is a major one for me because as working as an administrator in a retirement home, I had to deal with a lot of people sometimes who had dementia or Alzheimer's, which is a form of dementia. And at least it has been, but I mean, we've had very limited understanding of dementia and Alzheimer's for a very long time. And one of the interesting things is that in more and more scientific circles, Alzheimer's disease specifically is being referred to as type 3 diabetes because Alzheimer's is directly affected by insulin resistance. Now, how does that happen? Dr. Bickman says insulin resistance contributes directly to amyloid beta plaque that's produced in the brain, which the only way they know somebody actually had Alzheimer's is in the autopsy after death. They can see that plaque. They know that that is technically Alzheimer's disease. Well, that amyloid beta plaque is directly caused by insulin resistance. Now, the doctor doesn't claim to have all the answers to Alzheimer's disease directly. He goes into some of the details about how different things happen in the brain and how certain proteins unwind and things get twisted. But ultimately, that insulin resistance contributing to the production of that amyloid beta plaque is a huge reason why we have so many people having Alzheimer's today. I remember thinking when I was the administrator at that retirement home, is that what is it that we're eating that's causing this? Maybe it's some of the medicines we're taking. Maybe it's both. Well, now I realize that it could be part of the medicine side because we know what statins do as far as causing insulin resistance now. And a lot of people who wind up developing Alzheimer's are usually on some kind of statin because they've got insulin, re insulin resistance related problems going on. And then when you combine that with the food that people eat, especially elder, elderly people who are living alone oftentimes are eating a lot of this high processed garbage because it's easy to make as their bodies have slowed down and they've gotten a little bit harder time getting through the kitchen and managing their cooking. They wind up buying a lot of pre-made hamburgers and pre-made meals that they can just heat up in the microwave. And all of this stuff contributes because it has loads of glucose in it. It has loads of fructose in it. It has loads of seed oil in it. And all of those things are contributing to that insulin resistance, which is causing them to have the problems we see more and more with the elderly people on a much greater level. The doctor goes into specifically how insulin resistance has a major effect on vascular dementia, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, neuropathy, and even something I know a lot of people suffer from, including my own daughter, and that's migraine headaches. So if you've been looking for a solution to some of these things, 
Insulin resistance is certainly something you should be taking a closer look at. Our brains need a massive amount of energy to function properly, and they get that energy from glucose, unless you're operating on ketones, which is usually only for a short period of time. Even for somebody who's doing a carnivore diet like I am, I'm still using glucose because my liver produces glucose from the protein that I make, and that's a lot of time what I'm functioning on, unless I'm trying to get into a state of ketosis by increasing my fat content and reducing my protein content. But because our brains need so much to produce that energy, to give our brains the energy that we need, it's hugely important that our brain doesn't become insulin resistant and cause a lot of these problems that I think most of us would desperately like to avoid. Chapter four, he talks about reproductive health and he gets into a lot of how pregnant women can be greatly affected by insulin resistance. And even there's a, there's a medical term for when a woman becomes insulin resistant as a result of being pregnant itself. They called it uh, gestational diabetes. It's a type of pregnancy induced insulin resistance that's caused when the body can't process all the insulin that's coming in. And a lot of times that's gonna be affected by diet because as everyone knows, a woman who's pregnant likes to have her pickles and ice cream together or they're gonna eat all kind of crazy things because they get these urges that are controlled by those hormones and it's because that baby needs to have something to feed it. And ladies oftentimes will tend to eat things that aren't healthy for the child or for themselves, and it will cause that insulin resistance. There are other issues that can be caused by insulin resistance or that go on during pregnancy that uh, involve things like preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is related to kidney function disorders, and then that is directly affected by a lack of nitric oxide, which we've already looked at before, is reduced with insulin resistance. In some cases, children are born underweight or overweight for genetic reasons. But in most cases, if it's not related to genetics, it's related to insulin resistance in the parent. And if you've had anybody in your life who was trying to breastfeed their child and they were having struggles with having enough breast milk for their baby to stay healthy, not having enough breast milk is also related to insulin resistance. Now, insulin is not completely the bad guy. Like I said before, insulin is a very important hormone that helps our bodies function properly. And in women, it allows their ovaries to be able to produce estrogen. Insulin resistance can also cause hair to pop up in places that men and women don't want. If you've got more facial hair than you would like, aside from genetic reasons, it can also be related to insulin resistance. It also causes the hair to be coarser, and it can even cause fertility treatments to be hindered. So insulin resistance plays a big role in women. But what about men? Studies have shown that men who lose weight do see an increase in testosterone production. But even in situations where fat loss wasn't an issue, but insulin resistance was reversed, we've seen increases in testosterone because insulin as a hormone is what tells our body to also make testosterone. Studies have shown that insulin resistance directly inhibits testosterone production. As a matter of fact, the way the doctor put it is it turns our fat cells into ovaries in our body. Those fat cells begin producing estrogen as a result of insulin being at high levels in the blood, and insulin resistance is what causes those high levels in the blood. Some resulting issues with that are low sperm production and erectile dysfunction. Interestingly, also, it affects children greatly, too. Did you know the average age of puberty for a female back in the late 1800s was around 16 years of age, and the average age for a male was a little bit more, closer to 17? Today, the average for a girl is 9 to 10 years old, and for a boy is 10 to 12 years old. The reason this is the case is insulin is a big part of what turns on our sexual hormone system that switches us into puberty. So when kids become more insulin full or they have a lot more insulin in their body, it switches on puberty a lot earlier than it used to. And we've seen a steady decrease in the age that children are at as they hit puberty. That's why you're seeing girls a lot younger with fully developed bodies and boys that are going through more facial hair before they get out of high school. You know, a lot of these things sound great when you're in high school because everybody wanted to have a mustache if they were a guy and all the girls wanted to have, well, the features that girls have. And it seems like it could be a good thing, but naturally our bodies wait a little longer to go into puberty. But just as important is making sure that our children are not experiencing an augmented lifestyle 
as a result of the foods that we're eating. Now I've talked about in the past what he gets to in chapter five, which is cancer. And that's specifically how cancer eats a lot of glucose. It loves to eat glucose. But in addition to eating glucose, cancer cells have an abnormal amount of insulin receptors. Well, when fat cells become insulin resistant, that means there's more insulin in the blood and that insulin is feeding those cancer cells to continue to just powerhouse glucose into the cell, which causes the cells to get so full sometimes that they burst at the seams. Now, I'm not saying this is the only cause of cancer. There are some genetic related issues coming into contact, contact with certain carcinogens and radioactive materials can certainly cause cancer. But there is a huge factor going on here where our bodies are extremely ripe for cancer based on the kind of food we're putting in our bodies. There's a few type of cancers that some people worry about because they're prominent in their families, and that's breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer. All three of these are uniquely affected by insulin. Breast cells, for instance, are six times more responsive to insulin. And when they become cancerous, that just means they are on steroids, basically, with becoming with multiplying the cancerous cells that are going to be there. In chapter six, Dr. Binkman gets into how insulin resistance affects aging, skin, muscles, and bones. And these things kind of become apparent if you've been following along with my channel for a while and you've seen some of the breakthroughs that I've been able to make physically, everything from being able to climb up a rope with just my hands and things I never used to be able to do before, going on three mile walks with 40 pound vest on my body so that I can add a little resistance, doing push ups and pull ups and tricep dips and all the things that I've been doing that I never used to do even when I was younger than I am now is because all this, ins this reduction of glucose coming into my body and all the reduction of these oxidative stressing vegetable oils coming into my body have been able to heal my body of a lot of this insulin resistance. Now, we're not gonna be able to stop aging just by stopping insulin resistance, but having insulin resistance certainly speeds up the aging process and genetics play a role in how we age as well. But insulin resistance speeds up the aging process because it's related to oxidation and inflammation that goes on in our body. Skin related problems are often associated with insulin resistance, everything from psoriasis, to acne, to melanoma, all of these are found to have people who are insulin resistant. Interestingly, even hearing loss and tinnitus, I've had a lot of people ask about being able to fix that tinnitus because I've had tinnitus before in my life. I had tinnitus so bad that I had vertigo and it lasted for a couple of weeks way back in, I don't know, when was this, 2010, 2011, when I was about 260 pounds, which wasn't even the highest I had been. And nobody was able to tell me what was causing that or what might be causing that. Well, one of the things I started doing at the time was exercising, which has a tremendous effect as we'll get into in a future chapter on reducing insulin resistance. But the most important thing that I've been able to do to fight off some of the problems that come with hearing loss and tinnitus is reducing my insulin resistance level by reducing the amount of these things that I'm putting into my body. Diet plays the biggest role from what I've been able to tell. Now, muscles are highly responsive to insulin. And the interesting thing about muscles is that they can help us with having more places to store glucose because glucose is what feeds our muscles as well. Well, when you have more muscle mass, you have more room to store glucose. That allows us to be able to use that glucose to make more muscle. But insulin resistance makes muscle growth more difficult. And as more and more people are aging and finding out to be insulin resistant, that's one of the things that speeds up their muscle loss. Do you know anybody who suffers from fibromyalgia? You guessed it. It's related to insulin resistance as well and glucose control. You want to have strong bones? You've always heard, have your vitamin D. Vitamin D is good for bones. It's good for a number of things. But the reason why it's good for bones is because vitamin D has done has been directly linked to reducing insulin resistance. And insulin resistance slows bone growth. So there's just one more bullet in your chamber for understanding why insulin resistance can be such an important thing to consider. Because as we age, brittle bones can be a major problem. One of the things I used to deal with all the time, as I keep mentioning in my former life as a retirement home administrator, were falls. 
Falls weren't so bad if somebody didn't fall and hurt themselves. But when somebody falls and breaks a hip, that usually means they're going to be off their feet for long periods of time. And just being off their feet for weeks at a time could lead to so many more problems that develop while they're not getting any activity and while they're sitting there eating the food that hospitals feed us that follow all of the nutritional information that has been fed to us by our government over the last 50 years. The one thing doctors aren't really able to say is that they understand everything about why bones degrade and skin degrades and muscle degrades, but they have been able to say that insulin resistance is linked with all of them. Chapter seven covers our gastrointestinal health and kidney health. This is a big part for me because it talks about the issues that I was having and even where I've mentioned before that my kidneys were reducing in function. I wasn't even aware of that until I started to have improved kidney function and my doctor started to point out that my EGFR levels were increasing. And I thought, well, what, was there something wrong with my kidneys before? He said, well, no, but they were definitely showing a decline. So being able to switch off of the ultra processed food that I was used to eating and all of the seed oils and sugar helped me to bring those insulin resistance levels down that started to improve my kidney health and even my gut problems have gone away. Well, after a couple of days off since I was last recording, I figured I would come back and finish this up. I have just so much going on. It's amazing I can get any of these videos done sometimes. But I appreciate all you guys who do contribute to the channel through Patreon and those of you who have supported me through the purchasing of the products through the links that I have in the description and all of the companies that have supported me through affiliates. So that makes things a lot easier because without your support, I just wouldn't have the time to do the things that I do here. But I really wanna be able to help get this information out there so that you can share it with your friends and your loved ones. Because I guarantee you, especially in this area where we're talking about gastrointestinal and kidney health, this is gonna hit a lot of people right where the heart is. Because Dr. Bickman goes into how from the mouth all the way to the rectum, our digestive system can be greatly affected by insulin resistance. And a number of the issues that you might be hearing about maybe from your doctor are things like fatty liver disease, even non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I mean, some of us are drinking and then the doctor will immediately blame it on alcohol. But we're finding that this disease that used to be non-existent a few years ago is now becoming a regular thing where people have so much fat stored around their liver because of fructose consumption. Well, if you haven't looked at the package on most of everything that you drink that you buy from the store these days, and a lot of the foods you buy, they're using high fructose corn syrup instead of sugar. But because the way our bodies work, our livers are what process fructose. And the rest of our cells can process regular sugar without any trouble, but our livers have to do all the heavy lifting with fructose. And when it gets too much fructose, or enough fructose even, then it's gonna convert that into fat around the liver. And that is where you start to get that non-fatty liver disease problem. Gallbladder issues are greatly exacerbated by insulin resistance through the formation of gallstones. I've talked about this, how when I had my gallbladder removed back in 2002, it probably had a lot to do with the fact that I was doing a lot of low fat dieting. I was eating a lot of fruits and drinking fruit juices. And that lack of use of the gallbladder causes lack of motility. And that lack of motility causes gallstone formation. Well, the more insulin resistant you are, the heavier this effect is. To sum it up quickly, Dr. Bickman basically says that the most predictive factor is insulin resistance for whether or not somebody is gonna develop gall sludge. And when it comes to our kidneys, insulin resistance has two major ways that it contributes to the production of gallstones. For one, high insulin levels in the blood leads to high calcium levels in the blood, which is where your kidneys have to remove that calcium from your blood, and that causes the buildup inside of the kidneys to become gallstones, calcium gallstones. Insulin resistance, secondly, seems to play a role in the alkalinity of urine. It's likely that an insulin-resistant kidney can dissolve less of the molecules that counteract acid in urine, and as a result, stones begin to form. This segues perfectly into chapter eight where he begins to talk about metabolic syndrome and obesity. I'm not a big fan of quoting what their work is, but since YouTube requires that we stick to their standards, I'm gonna point out that the World Health Organization defines metabolic syndrome as insulin resistance plus any two of the following, hypertension, dyslipidemia, central obesity, or low levels of protein in the urine. As a matter of fact, metabolic syndrome was originally called insulin resistance syndrome. You see, insulin is a strong advocate of fat cell growth. 
it actually tells the body not to use the fat, but rather to tell the cells to continue to grow. He gets into a little bit here about how there's a big dispute as to whether or not insulin resistance causes obesity or if obesity causes insulin resistance, and that there are cases to be made for both. But from what everything I can tell, from the way my body has responded to changing the way that I eat, along with a lot of the other research I've done, and exactly what Dr. Bickman says here in his book, is that it sure seems to be that insulin resistance is the starting point and obesity is the resulting factor. But that's, that's my speculation. He doesn't make that quite as clear. He does talk about several books that you could read specifically to be able to get familiar with this, like Dr. Gary Taub's Good Calories, Bad Calories, Dr. Jason Fung's The Obesity Code, Dr. David Ludwig's book, Always Hungry, and Dr. Stephen Guinet's book, The Hungry Brain. And I will put links for all of those in the description so you can find them quickly. He goes on to cover some things about why we get fat and even leptin resistance is discussed heavily here. Bottom line seems to be if insulin is elevated, body fat is elevated. The next section of the book is part two, where he covers in chapters 9 through 13 a number of issues dealing with insulin resistance and the causes. Chapter 9 basically covers the three things that are beyond our control, genetics, ethnicity, and age. Chapter 10 deals specifically with how hormones are related to insulin resistance. Hormones affect other hormones, and insulin is a vital hormone, but too much causes insulin resistance, and small changes in fasting insulin levels make a huge difference. He also goes into how the stress-related hormones like epinephrine and cortisol also contribute to insulin resistance. In chapter 11, he revisits obesity and insulin resistance and how they're related. And he also talks about ways that you can kind of check yourself by looking at your hip to waist ratio. And what he says is, is you can take your, your waist measurement, which is right across your belly button and around this area, and compare that to the measurement right across the top of your butt around your hips. You take your waist number divided by your hip size number, and that number should give you a pretty good idea of whether or not you're doing good. For men, that number should be below 0.9, and for women, it should be below 0.8. For example, if your waist was 30 inches and your hips were 40 inches, that would give you a number of 0.75, which would be a good number for a man or a woman. I don't know that this is always exactly accurate because some men have a bigger butt than others too. I tend to suffer from the same thing that Hank Hill suffers from on the TV show King of the Hill where I just got no meat back there. So my weight, my hip measurement is extremely small, whereas my waist area is where I tend to retain most of my fat too. So my number is closer to a one, even though I'm in the best shape I could be in. So I don't know that this is going to be an exact measurement for everyone, but that was the measurement the doctor used that I thought I would share with you so you'd have some idea of maybe where you stand. If you look at that and you see that your number is well over 0.9 or 0.8, depending on your sex, then you just might want to take a closer look at how controlling your insulin levels could change your health. There's also a test that you can do to check and see what type of fat cells you have. If you have small hyperplasic fat cells, then you're probably in better shape than if you have large hypertrophic fat cells. Here's a little diagram that kind of shows the difference there. In hyperplasia, more smaller fat cells are insulin sensitive, so that's the healthy fat. But in hypertrophy, few lar fewer and larger fat cells are insulin resistant. This is the sick fat. These are the ones that have leaking fats because they're so stuffed with fat that they actually burst at the seams. And that material leaking out of there are inflammatory proteins that get into our bloodstream and it causes inflammation throughout the body, which causes more problems than just the insulin resistance itself, which is how we get a lot of the gut problems that we wind up talking about that I had. Then Dr. Bickman points out a formula that you can ask your doctor to take a look at for you. He says you can ask your PCP to measure your insulin levels in microunits per millimeter or UUML and your free fatty acids in MMOL per liter. Insulin number times free fatty acids number equals your score. If your score is above 9.3, it means you're insulin resistant, but below 9.3, your fat cells are doing okay. So 
There's another little piece of homework you can do with your doctor if you'd like that might be able to help you determine your insulin resistance level. I'm going to be trying to apply some of these things the next time I see my family physician. And I also just got something in the mail today from Keto Mojo that I ordered on Amazon. I am not associated with Keto Mojo, at least not at the moment. I am reaching out to them about this because I actually met them at KetoCon. But I never was interested in doing anything like this because I didn't feel like it was important to track these numbers. Well, this little device here tracks both ketones and glucose. And I thought it would be a good idea since as a carnivore, when you eat a lot of protein, your liver makes all of your glucose from that protein. And I've heard about people having elevated glucose levels even on carnivore. So I thought I would start taking a closer look at how the meals that I eat affect my blood sugar levels as well as my ketosis level, uh, something that I haven't monitored at all since being on a carnivore diet. And if you're interested in taking a look at one of these, I can give you my Amazon Associates link in the description so you can get one too. And then we can do a little bit of this together because I just, I'm, I'm getting to the point where even though early on in this diet, I was being very relaxed about how I was doing everything, just focused on eating when I was hungry and feeling the difference. Now I wanna get more scientific about what I'm doing because especially since I have more and more people asking me for help and trying to find the way out of their the problem that they're in and I'm finding out about different people's issues and how different things affect different people differently, I'm spending a lot more time focusing my attention on stuff like this so that I can give you guys more resources. He goes into a lot of biochemistry lesson in this chapter, which is very helpful for understanding a number of different things, including fatty liver, fatty pancreas, fatty muscle, and he even covers lipodystrophy, which is where somebody is unable to produce fatty tissue. Chapter 12 covers inflammation and oxidative stress, both which are critical factors in our immune function, but even they can cross the line from being good to being bad, and lead to insulin resistance. Infection-related illnesses can cause insulin resistance. Autoimmune issues are heavily related to insulin resistance. Even sepsis is related to insulin resistance. Obesity itself can be considered an inflammatory disorder because of, as I mentioned before, the cytokines that are released from those fat cells that are bursting at the seams and releasing inflammatory proteins into the system, causing more inflammation. So inflammation drives insulin resistance, but what drives inflammation more than anything, it's what we put into our bodies. It's our diet. And that's where in chapter 13, he starts to get into lifestyle factors. And this is the area where I think he hits the nail on the head with helping us know how to deal with preventing insulin resistance. And it's not just diet either. He talks about things like cigarette smoke, breathing pollution. Those things have a big factor, but more than anything else, what we eat is the largest factor that's currently contributing to the insulin resistance at the levels we're seeing today. He talks about the role of things like monosodium glutamate, some petrochemicals like BPA, which is in most everything we buy in bottles today, pesticides, which are on tremendous amounts of foods, foods like wheat and oats, how sugars and artificial sweeteners can lead to insulin resistance. In the case of artificial sweetener, I mean, in the case of sugar, we already understand that, but even artificial sweeteners, and I've talked about this in other videos before, we can have what's called a cephalic phase insulin response, where our mouth sends a signal to our brain that tells our pancreas that sugar's on the way down, so it starts producing insulin because it can't tell the difference between the sweetness in an artificial sweetener and the sweetness that's in sugar. So it boosts the insulin level to start dealing with that glucose. Well, it's not so much that it's a problem because there's no glucose for it to deal with, but that elevated insulin level contributes to insulin resistance. He even talks about how not having enough salt can contribute to insulin resistance. And for those of us who choose to go on a starvation diet or certain eating disorders that basically starve us to death, even that can cause insulin resistance because once our body runs out of fat to use, up until then, our body is really protecting our muscle because there's fat to be used. But once the fat storage is gone, it begins consuming the muscle as well. And that muscle, all of that glucose that's stored in those muscles contributes to insulin resistance. He talks about sleep in this chapter. And I've covered sleep several times on my channel. And I've talked about how in the past I loved when I was getting four to five hours of sleep at night. And yet I was waking up ready to go and charge for the day. 
I realize now that that's because my body was using a lot more ketones and I had a lot more energy then. Lately, I've been sleeping about seven hours and that's perfect for me. I go to sleep immediately at night. I wake up ready to go in the morning and that turns out to be a really good number. Some people say eight hours of sleep. Some people say six hours of sleep. Somewhere between six and eight seems to be the sweet spot for most people. And also having a nap during the day about 30 minutes at most. Anything more than that seems to lead to higher glucose spikes after a longer nap, and that tends to cause you to be groggier. But getting the right amount of sleep and maybe having that mid midday nap, if we can get back to that, that has been tremendously beneficial for me on the days that I've taken the time to do it. Now, I know with all of our busy schedules and most of us are at work during the day, it's hard to squeeze in a nap somewhere. But if you think about a one hour lunch break, and if you can squeeze in 30 minutes to get some shut eye and maybe set your alarm to go off to wake you up so you don't go beyond that 30 minutes, it could be tremendously beneficial for your overall health. And it also helps to relieve insulin resistance. One thing that's for sure is not getting enough sleep can cause an up to 30% increase in is insulin resistance is in as little as a week. Other things that contribute to poor health and insulin resistance is getting too much light at night looking at your phone just before going to bed. Try to get that light from being soaked up by your eyes early before you go to bed so that you're not switching on those receptors in your brain that get you confused about night and day affecting your circadian rhythm. And getting that exercise like we talk about, getting out for those morning walks or those morning rucks like I like to do still. I just don't always record them as much anymore because I don't have as much time to do all the editing I would like to do lately. It's extremely important to get those push-ups in, to get those squats in, to get that walk in, to get that movement going on. I'm considering doing more of the HIT type training, H-I-I-T, so that I can have more time to do all the things I have, in a, have to do in a day because the three mile walk or three mile ruck has been great for me, but lately my time has been so constricted, doing something like HIT would be greatly beneficial because I don't wanna let up on keeping that lack of sedentariness from getting back into my life because a sedentary lifestyle also has been proven to show increase in insulin resistance. Now you don't have to be doing things like HIT or heavy weight training or anything like that. Simply flexing your muscles while you're sitting at your desk and, and keeping your blood flowing. Simple things like that. I remember seeing a movie with, where Bruce Lee was talking about how he used uh, basically a TENS unit to, to flex his muscles and I thought that can't be worth anything. But technically, flexing those muscles actually does make a big difference in helping you prevent insulin resistance from sedentary living. And that leads us right into part three and chapter 14 through the end of the book, where he talks about the solution, things we can do to fight insulin resistance. And the number one thing he goes into in chapter 14 is get moving, get that physical activity. Something like I've talked about before, I know that if you are like I was when I started doing Lion Diet, you just don't feel like you have the energy to get up and do that stuff. And you may also say you don't have the time to do it. But gosh darn it, I tell you, when you start eating the things that make your body healthy, when you start eating the things that your body responds to and says, yes, this is exactly what we've been needing, like I've been doing on a carnivore way of eating on the lion diet where I eat ruminant meat, water, and salt, it just supercharged my body to the point where I had so much energy that if I didn't go exercise, I felt like I was going to explode like a battery that had too much power in it. So finally, getting out and getting that exercise wasn't a, wasn't this torturous challenge that it used to be. It was something that I look forward to doing, and it's still something I look forward to doing. I've had people tell me that walking doesn't do anything, that I got to be in there lifting weights. And there is something to be said about how pumping iron, doing the heavier, more re resistance type activity is going to have a quicker, longer lasting effect. But getting any type of activity is important. If you're somebody who is not getting any activity, just getting that level up to where you're doing something, even a little bit of aerobic exercise is going to be better than nothing. But if you want to really be able to maximize your benefits, getting into more resistance training, things like HIT, things like weight training are going to really multiply those results. But I don't want to discourage anybody who has been sitting on the couch talking about how they want to get up and go walking to not want to get up and go walking because walking is what got me to the point that I'm at now. Walking was a huge contributing factor to getting me into any kind of exercise. 
And now that I've gotten to the point where I just want to be able to squeeze more into smaller amounts of time, as I start to switch over to heavier intense exercise for shorter periods of time, just understand that it's not because I'm trying to show off. It's because I just don't have time for the longer lasting exercises that are lower impact. He even talks about how cold exposure plays a role with the thing called brown fat. And I'll let you read all about that. But I'm not huge on cold exposure. I have done a couple of cold showers in my life. I've even done a dunk back when I was at KetoCon last year. Not the most exciting thing in the world, but there's a lot of people who swear by it. So if it's something that you'd like to look into, check into cold exposure and how that can be good for your health. Wim Hof is a good one to look up on this one. Chapter 15 is called Eat Smart, the evidence on the food we eat. Dr. Bickman calls this the most powerful part of the solution, but the most difficult part to change. I can truly relate to that. But when you get to that breaking point in your life where you realize you've got to make a change, once you make that change and you look back on it, you're going to realize it was the easiest, simplest thing you could have done. And it breaks you free from so many other areas of, of restriction in your life, of things that you just literally feel like you've had chains around you your whole life. Being able to chisel away that body that you wanted to get out of, that fat suit that you wanted to take off and just step out and be the real you that you feel like is underneath there. Once you make that change, it is so much easier to do everything and life just tastes sweeter. I mean, I have a saying now that nothing tastes better than feeling good. And that's because once you feel good, you want that more. You want that more than comfort food and junk food and the processed garbage that these companies have all got us hooked on. You can have that, but you've got to get to that point in your life where you say, I am tired of feeling this way. I am tired of hurting. I'm tired of looking this way. I'm tired of having the clothes not fit the way I want. I'm tired of all of it. And I'm going to do something to make it different. That breaks me free from all these systems that we have built up around us that exacerbate the problem that comes with eating ultra processed garbage, that comes with eating sugar, that comes with consuming vegetable oils, that comes with the lifestyle that we live that is built around the consumption of junk that's just not good for us. There's a quote Dr. Binkman makes in the book that I want to read so I don't get it wrong at all. And he says, when it comes to diet, we got it wrong. The epidemics of obesity and insulin resistance are partly the product of bending science to fit politics. And that's what I'm talking about. This is me speaking now. That's what I'm talking about when I say that we have been lied to. When people want to try to bend science to fit politics, that's create a narrative as we hear often about today is going on in all the movies we watch and the commercials we watch. Lord knows Katie's been watching The Office again lately, one of her favorite TV shows. And I'll sit and watch TV with her at night, even though I'm not really paying attention anymore. The thing that really gets me when it comes to that stuff, though, are these awful commercials that come on and talk about these medicines that you can take to live life normal again. And then at the end, it mentions all the side effects that you're going to be bleeding from the eyes and death and all these other horrible side effects. And I think to myself... I'm told that what I'm doing is unhealthy and I've already cured problems like what they're talking about in this commercial and I don't have to take any of that garbage with all those awful side effects. And I, I just, it, it, it's like a microchip in my brain starts to get fried out because I think people are out there looking for help, listening to these commercials that come on this box on the wall and it's telling them to take things that are not going to fix their problem, but are going to cause new, more elaborate problems. And it just breaks my heart because there is so much to be found in eating the right diet, getting away from all that processed garbage. And there's going to be a lot of arguments from vegans out there. They're going to tell me that they've gotten similar results doing a vegan diet. And I tell you, if you found good results doing a vegan diet, then do it, especially if you're getting away from ultra-processed foods. 
I don't think it's the best choice because in the long run, I notice vegans tend to act a little crazier and they also tend to look a little bit more pale and peakish. They also tend to be a lot weaker. They get easier broken bones. And there's been a lot of health issues as a result of not getting enough nutrition from the food. You can get everything you need for your body from meat, but you can't get everything you need from vegetables. So between the two, meat, the real superfood, has just been gangbusters for me. And I hardly ever get hungry. I've gone up to 24, 36 hours before I realize, you know what? I'm hungry. I need to eat something. Because when you eat an all meat diet, especially high in fat, then it's very satiating and your body doesn't get hungry because there's not something in here. Your body gets hungry because there's no evidence of nutrients that your stomach is sending a signal to your brain saying, okay, the nutrients are here. We can stop eating now. That's what you need to have is you need to have something that's telling your body you got what you need. And a lot of the foods that you're eating on an ultra processed food diet or even on, a, even on a vegan diet, you're not getting the nutrients you need. And you're trying to convince yourself you're full by stuffing your stomach with dietary fiber and it doesn't work that way. The doctor talks about specifically how our body doesn't respond to hunger this way. Otherwise, people who were starving wouldn't respond well when they're put on an IV drip. All of a sudden, they're not hungry anymore and they feel better again. They're not getting less hungry because what they're getting through their IV is filling their stomach. They're getting less hungry because their body is telling their brain, we've got the nutrients we need now. Dr. Bickman is not prescribing a carnivore diet here. He goes into a lot of smart decisions you can make, but he is definitely not against eating saturated fat. He goes into how the saturated fats have been made the bad guy when they're not the bad guy. He talks about the dangers of monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, and how the different fats work. Mono and polyunsaturated fats can be found in certain other meats too, like bacon, for instance, has a lot of polyunsaturated fats. And then vegetables have those monounsaturated fats like you get with margarine and things like that. And those are where you get a lot of problems from the fats. He even advocates for having some starches, which I have found that I haven't needed. But if you're going to eat starches, he talks about at least eating those at the end of your, car of your highest carb meal, but to keep those to a minimum. He talks about benefits of fiber, even though I don't necessarily agree with the, net, the necessity of fiber. He does talk about some effects that fiber can have on insulin resistance. So maybe there is something to be learned from that. And I'm not going to say that I'm the expert on everything. But I will say that the things that I've been told about fiber is that without fiber, you're not going to be able to go to the bathroom. I have no issues going to the bathroom on an all meat diet. I'm going to tell you right now. I don't have hard stool problems unless I don't get enough fat. So, I mean, fat regulation is the biggest factor for that. I have not had any issues where I have felt like I needed dietary fiber. But because I am going to be keeping a closer eye on this insulin thing, it will be something in the back of my mind that I may take a look at eventually. So even I'm not close-minded to listening to things that smarter people than me are willing to take a close look at and be objective with the research and talk about the benefits. So if I find out something changes in that regard, I'll let you know. But for now, I'm still fine having a couple of pounds of steak or burger or whatever with plenty of fat, usually trying to get around a 70% fat to 30% protein ratio in my diet. And I'm happy. He covers the benefits of intermittent fasting. And he even goes into how people who fast 24 hours at least once a month are half as likely to be insulin resistant. So there is a link to using intermittent fasting for the benefit of reducing insulin resistance. But there is a fine line to be drawn between fasting and starvation. As long as you're getting the fluids that you need and you're getting some mineral supplements of some kind, whether that be potassium or magnesium or even just salt, a lot of times that's enough for you to have the energy you need and to not be in starvation mode. But the length of the fast actually doesn't matter as much as you might think. I used to think that it was crazy to consider that Jesus did a 40-day fast. And I've heard of people fasting a lot longer than that. I heard of one guy that fasted for well over a year using supplements and water 
and did not go into starvation mode, but lost a tremendous amount of weight and then was able to maintain that healthy lifestyle after he lost all that weight. So there is a lot of benefit in fasting. Dr. Jason Fung, we mentioned one of his books earlier, is a big proponent of intermittent fasting. And he has a lot of videos on YouTube that I would certainly recommend that you look into when it comes to intermittent fasting. One of the most important things you wanna consider when you're fasting, and Dr. Bickman does talk about this, is refeeding syndrome. And refeeding syndrome, it turns out, is actually related to too much insulin hitting the blood too fast by eating too much food after a long period of time of not eating food. Refeeding syndrome can be deadly. So be extremely careful if you take longer fasts to make sure that you eat small amounts of food, particularly something that's not high in sugar. Avoid seed oils at all times. Avoid ultra-processed foods at all times. So one of the things I like to use to break a fast is maybe a little bit of dehydrated meat, bone broth or uh, bouillon cubes or something like that. Anything that's gonna give you a little bit of the energy that your body is missing from not eating without overwhelming your system with insulin after a long period of time of having basically your metabolic process shut down. It's in, we're out to lunch mode <laughs> for a long period of time. Well, if you start getting all those processes working and all the little workers aren't where they belong in their positions, then it can cause a lot of dangerous stuff in your body. So that's the most dangerous thing to consider is what you're gonna eat when you get done uh, doing a fast. And it's really not that big a deal. Just don't overdo it when you break your fast. That's the biggest factor that I've been able to, to take away for, for my own personal knowledge. And there are a lot of experts out there, like I said, like Dr. Jason Fung, that will help you to know how to properly bake, break a fast without hurting yourself. He also talked about when you eat being a big factor. And there's a, a phenomenon known as the dawn phenomenon where around 5.30 in the morning, our glucose levels start to rise. So our insulin levels start to rise. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of carnivores you'll hear talk about that they don't do breakfast, that they like to end, they like to end their sleeping fast without eating food right away and doing their breaking of their fast, which is why we call it breakfast, too early because that way we can use we can go through that increased glucose level period in the morning without adding to it by eating food at the same time especially some of the foods that most people eat for breakfast good lord you'd think it was dessert time to eat at breakfast between french toast and pancakes and all the things that people pour sugar and goo all over cereals and junk that is just loaded with sugar it's like the worst possible time for us to be eating anything that spikes glucose levels. And doing that in the morning just increases the likelihood of having too much insulin in the blood, which is going to increase your likelihood of having insulin resistance. He talked about how tests had, be done, had been done comparing the different types of breakfast that people ate. And if it was a more fatty breakfast, it had less it had less of an effect on insulin levels rising because dietary fat has been shown to have no insulin effect at all. So if you're going to eat something for breakfast, something high in fat is going to be your best choice. Restricting carbohydrates overall has proven to be the best way to get insulin under control. And what better way to restrict carbohydrates than a carnivore way of eating? Obviously, there are some options you can do that might be you know, less than carnivore that are still going to be healthy. But that's I stick with carnivore because it's easy and it's been working for me and I love it. So that's why I continue to do it. And it's effective. I will say one thing that I often warn people about being careful with, if you're doing a carnivore way of eating, splurging on something that's high in sugar is going to be a bad combination because eating carbs with protein causes a robust rise in insulin levels. Eating fewer to no carbs has little to no effect on insulin levels. Eating sugar when you're on a carnivore diet is a really bad idea because it, that sugar is going to cause insulin to be released in the blood and insulin inhibits gluconeogenesis where you're converting your protein into glucose. And for people who are interested in losing weight and getting healthy like I've been doing but are really still skeptical of a carnivore way of eating, he does go into a lot of good information in this chapter on reduced glycemic load foods so that you have a choice of a lot of different things that might be very beneficial for you. Because I know from experience that family members that I have 
are just they're they're stone set against doing an all carnivore way of eating. So I don't want to get anybody out there who might be just dead set afraid to try something like this, no matter what, because I understand you've been propagandized to for the past 50 years that red meat is bad for you. It's going to be hard for you to overcome a lot of this. But take a look at some of the things he talks about here, because he talks about certain nuts and beans and breads and other things that are available out there that don't have a high glycemic load. Now, there's two things. There's a glycemic load and a glycemic index, but I'm going to have to let you guys read the book on that because this is an area where I kind of zoned out for a little bit because I'm just not interested in trying certain things anymore because of the gut problems that have been done to me over the years. Every time I've tried to reincorporate certain vegetables or beans or legumes or any of that stuff that he talked about, I get so many pains and problems in my digestion that I just stick with what works for me. Dr. Bickman goes into how the, the most interesting fat that you need to be aware of is one called ceramide. And ceramide is not a dietary fat. Ceramide is a type of fat that's produced in our body when inflammation has a certain effect on our fat cells, turning it into ceramide. Ceramide makes our cells less responsive to insulin. So that's where insulin resistance begins to set in. It's like the earliest phase is in our fat cells. And that's the one that where, where it kind of helps to understand how insulin resistance begins. And inflammation is a big part of that. And then he goes back into oxidative stress and inflammation and how our diet contributes to these things. He even talks about how low carb, high fat diets not only res reduced insulin resistance, but also re reduced oxidative stress and inflammation which I've certainly experienced. Here he gets into some of the benefits of ketosis. And that's again, one of the reasons that I've been starting to wanna to monitor my ketone levels and see that if I can get my, bad, my body back into a state of ketosis, something I thought that I would just maintain when I was on a carnivore way of eating. But after doing some recent keto sticks checks, I realized I'm not in ketosis. And I've been hearing about this where you can have higher elevated blood glucose levels even while eating a high protein diet. So it's one of those things that I'm monitoring more closely. And that's why I'm here sharing this information with you, because as I learn new things, I want to be able to share them with you. I know early on in my diet, I was in a state of, I was in a state of ketosis because I was constantly converting my body fat into energy and using it. But now my body wants to try to store more body fat because there's an adaptation that's gone on that I want to understand better. And that's something that I'm working to understand better, too. So even though I'm not saying I have all the answers now, as I continue to go down this road and I learn new things, I'm going to come back and share those things here, here with you. But a state of ketosis is beautiful because it allows stored energy to be wasted from the body rather than stored. And if insulin levels are high, ketogenesis stops. So you stop getting the benefits of ketosis. And there are a lot of benefits of ketosis in general as far as the healing factors in our body. Our brain operates wonderfully on ketones. He even talked about how exogenous ketones are showing some progress in helping people. Now, I looked at some of the exogenous ketones that you can buy, basically supplemental ketones that you can consume. And I kind of shy away from that being an idea because I want to stick more with a natural way of doing things. I try to avoid any supplementation unless it's absolutely necessary because of allergies or any other issues that I might be having like age-related uh, reduced vitamin D levels, difficulty bringing in sunshine through my skin. I've been able to cure a lot of things in my body, but I'm not going to be able to cure old age completely. And I'm not looking to either. But my point is, is there's always going to be something that maybe are, that our age or other health related problems we've created through diet over the years of our life might be limiting us. So supplementation might be useful in some areas, but this seems like an area where it just felt unnecessary to me. I want to find a way to be able to get my own body into ketosis rather than having a induced form of ketosis by consuming exogenous ketones. But the doctor did say that they do show some progress in helping remove glucose from the blood and helping with weight loss, but they don't do anything with regard to insulin resistance. So he didn't go into a whole lot more detail since the book focuses on reducing insulin resistance. It appears from what he talks about in this, this chapter is that when we eat more dietary fat, 
Our liver processes more fat than it can handle, and the excess fat is made into ketones. So that's why I've been trying to do an increased fat ratio on my diet lately to see if that's going to help me to be able to enter ketosis. And now I'll be able to monitor that a little closer and hopefully be able to report back in future videos on how this new experimentation that I'm doing to see what my body's actually going through might be helpful for you guys when you've been doing a carnivore diet for as long as I have or even longer. And I know there are a lot of other YouTube channels out there where doctors have talked about this and I just don't have time to watch all of them myself. So I'm going to share my experiences as long as I can because I know a lot of you follow my channel because I'm just a regular guy like you. I work a full-time job still. I got to go through all the daily grind. I'm not a doctor that has an unbelievable amount of resources. And hopefully my experience can be able to help you guys more along with the knowledge that I'm trying to gain from books like this and other doctors that I'm paying attention to so that I can give you the everyday guy's perspective on all the things that I've been able to learn, but also be able to offer beyond what my knowledge has been up until now. Chapter 16 talks about conventional interventions such as medicine and surgery. He wasn't a big fan of a lot of those options, and I didn't really go into the chapter too deep myself because they're just not areas that I'm willing to explore because I don't feel like drugs have a tremendous amount of answers for us. They're more of Band-Aids on, on problems that need bigger solutions. And then surgeries, although they can give people quick and easy results, a lot of times there's some side effects they don't talk about. There's some problems that can occur as a result of the surgeries. So I don't try to delve into those because I'm looking for the natural ways that we're going to be able to heal our bodies. But you can read all about that in chapter 16. Finally, Chapter 17, he puts a plan together for those of you who are reading the book, how to put all of this research into action. He gives you like a multi-point way of determining whether or not you're actually insulin resistant. He asks a series of questions. The questions are, do you have more fat around your belly than you would like? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have a family history of heart disease? Do you have high levels of blood triglycerides? Do you retain water easily? Do you have little patches of darker colored skin or bumps on, of skin, skin tags at your neck and armpits and other areas? Do you have a family member with insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes? Do you have polycystic ovarian syndrome women or erectile dysfunction for men? If you answered any two of these questions with a yes, you very likely have insulin resistance. Even if you only answered one of them yes, there's still a likelihood that you have insulin resistance. He talks about how you can get your insulin levels checked, but there is not a whole lot of uh, consensus on what the insulin levels should be. However, the author suggests that your insulin levels should be less than six micro units per liter of blood. I know I'm going to be looking into some of these blood tests myself, and I'll be reporting back to you on what those blood tests tell me. But he does say that if you do go through your doctor, you'll probably get your fasting insulin checked, not your actual insulin levels. And he says if you're going to get your, your fasting insulin checked, that you definitely want to get your fasting, your fasting blood glucose level checked at the same time. And he has a formula that you can use to follow to kind of have an idea whether or not that tells you you have insulin resistance. Again, this isn't etched in stone. This is more of his research coming together. But he says the value is glucose in milligrams per deciliter times the insulin in micro units per milliliter divided by 405 for the U.S. or glucose millimeters per liter times insulin micro units per milliliter divided by 22.5 for most of the other countries. Roughly, a value of over 1.5 means you're insulin resistant, and a value of over 3 indicates potential diabetes type 2. He also says that fasting insulin might skew results, so you can do something called an insulin response blood test, where you, you take your blood, you, you check your glucose levels, and then you drink something that's high in glucose, and then about 30 minutes later, you check it again, and then you check it another 30 minutes, and maybe another hour after that. There's varying tests on this that maybe check twice or check three times. But as you start to see the, the glucose 
levels dropping off in the blood, you start to see where the insulin levels are. And he says specifically, if your insulin peaks at 30 minutes and then steadily comes down, you're likely to be insulin, insulin sensitive, which is a good thing. You want to be insulin sensitive, not insulin resistant. If it's 60 minutes and then it comes down, you're likely already insulin resistant. And if it takes 120 minutes for your blood sugar to start to come down, you're almost certainly insulin resistant at that point. He even goes into some ways that diabetics can track insulin resistance based on how much glucose they have to give themselves. But to wrap up everything, his dietary information talks about controlling the carbohydrates that you're taking in the best you can, avoiding sugar, being smart about starches, don't drink your carbs. If you're gonna take in carbs, don't drink them because they have a much faster effect on insulin production. Fermented carbs can be good. A lot of people have mentioned to me about using things like sauerkraut and pickles, and I'm sure those things are great. I just haven't had a need to bring those things back into my diet, but I'm not totally against the idea of considering those options. And for people who are still resistant to a carnivore way of eating, I would encourage you to give those a try at the very least, along with a higher protein diet. He says it's important to prioritize protein, but you don't have to necessarily get as much protein as I'm eating. He basically says in the book about 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of weight. That way you would know how much protein you need to be sure you're getting each day. For me, that's about a quarter pound of protein, which is probably a lot less than I'm eating right now. But that way you have some options if you're just not ready to go full force on a carnivore way of eating. He mentions a few supplements that can be valuable here, like zinc, vitamin D, magnesium, some dairy products, chromium picolinate, but he also suggests avoiding meal replacement shakes. I've seen a few of those even on some carnivore influencers out there. I would avoid those meal replacement shakes. The author encourages getting full eating things where there's fat. And he doesn't limit that to animal fats. He talks about some of the healthy fats like avocado and olive oil and coconut. But that's an area where you're going to have to read the book for a little more because I have no experience in that area. I know that I do a lot of animal fats and it seems to be doing wonders for me. He talks about watching the clock and he even encourages people who are probably used to a three meal a day type of regimen to start getting at least a 12 hour fast between your last meal of the day and your first meal the following day because that's gonna help you to be able to reduce some of your insulin resistance. I, I know from experience, having gone from where I was the type of person that wanted to eat at least at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, to think about having that long gap between eating is just being impossible. Well, now I can go well over 24 hours without eating and I'm still not even hungry, but that took some time. I've done one meal a day before and I've done two meals a day for most of my diet now for a long time. And the one thing that I didn't focus on too much was when I was eating those meals. Sometimes I would have one in the morning and in the evening, but I found now that skipping that morning meal, as we talked about before, because of the higher glucose levels and higher insulin levels that you have in the morning, if you can wait until lunchtime to have that first meal and maybe have your next meal around dinner time, that'll make it a lot easier to stretch that but from 12 hours uh, of fasting to even 18 hours. And at some point, it's good to maybe do a 24 hour fast. So eating that one meal a day can be beneficial, maybe once a week or something like that if you're not able to do it all the time. Don't make it a focus that if you can't do it every day that it's gonna be a problem. Being able to get some kind of intermittent fasting in there is gonna be healthier for your body overall and it's gonna help you regulate those insulin levels. He even goes into some recommended foods if you're gonna have breakfast. He goes into some recommended foods for lunches and suppers. But again, I'm gonna let you read the book to get all that information. And finally, he goes into how you're gonna get resistance from friends and family and how you can overcome these things. The best thing I can tell you from my experience is just to recognize that it's human nature. And a lot of times, misery loves company. They don't wanna see that you're solving a problem that they're not willing to face right now. And what I can encourage you with is that teaching people through example is gonna go a lot better than preaching to people and beating their head over with what you're doing. I put this information online. It helps me to be able to share this information with people who are receptive to it. It really breaks my heart when people I love are not receptive to what I'm trying to tell them because I wanna save their life. And it makes it really hard, especially when I find out, like I had a friend of mine tell me yesterday that he has got a type of blood cancer that is gonna start having to take treatments for, and he's looking for natural healthy options 
to be able to stop this. And now I've got an opportunity to be able to speak to him about some things that are related to what sugar does with cancer and how that high process, that ultra processed food that we're all so used to eating and that we all revel in and love to talk about and love to share stories about the foods we ate, how these are the type of things that lead us in to situations where we may have to deal with problems like this. And hopefully it can be useful for him with the therapy that he's doing and whatever he's going to be doing with his doctors to have a good treatment system that's going to not only reverse the problem, but make it where his body is less likely to, to allow these things to take effect anymore and cause problems in his life. Because insulin resistance is almost certainly a big part of the factor that led to what he's dealing with right now. If people aren't really willing to listen, you're not going to be able to force it down their throats. And your closest friends and loved ones are going to be the ones that make it the hardest on you. So Dr. Bickham basically talks a little bit about that. And all I can tell you is to lead by example. Make sure that you're putting the things in your body that are going to help you reduce your blood glucose levels, that are going to help you keep your insulin under control, that are going to help you live and feel the best way you possibly can. I know that's what's been working for me. So that's going to do it for this video, guys. I appreciate you for tuning in for as long as you have, especially those of you who have made it to the end of this long video. I really appreciate your time, and I hope you'll check out my ending credits so I can give some credit to one of my affiliates and my patrons who make a lot of this possible. I'll see you guys next time. If we pay extra, could we maybe get some grease or fat? One of the things I do to fight back against big food and big pharma is to recommend companies that make animal-based products that are good for our bodies and good for our skin. In this case, I'm talking about Vintage Tradition. Vintage Tradition tallow balms are a go-to for me now, especially the unscented one. I like it because it doesn't have anything extra in it other than extra virgin olive oil and tallow rendered from suet. This is the interior fat, also called suet or kidney fat, for the tallow they use making the tallow bomb, highly saturated and therefore more therapeutic than any other. They don't use any trim fat or any other fats besides suet. So if you want some ancestrally appropriate skincare products that are going to help support the carnivore movement, head over to VintageTradition.com and use my discount code DANTE, D-A-N-T-E, to save 10% on your order. I promise you won't regret it. Their products are fantastic. I love them and I use them all the time.